I'm so excited to have Dr. Lillian Ardell, PhD, on the podcast, the founder of Language Matters. Bienvenido a la podcast. Mm-hmm. Hi, Tan. Thank you so, so much for bringing me on here this morning for me, this evening for you, I believe. Yes, in Phnom Penh. <laughs> I'm in the future. Yes. Your future looks good. Oh, good. I'm really happy to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Would you start us off with a story about that has really influenced your practice to this day. It doesn't have to be about yeah. working with multilinguals, but it can be if you want. Sure. So um, hmm, a story that has influenced where I am today. Yeah, I guess we'll start with my mama. Um, my mama, Susan Ardell, who was a performer, um, a gifted, gifted linguist. When I say performer, she was a legit actress, working actor in the, in Chicago in the seventies. And I observed as a youngster, my mother, um, come alive through communication and language and speech. And uh, that said across languages and the full expression of herself was something that I picked up on is a little, a little Leo. I'm very much Leo energy, fire sign, very expressive, very extroverted. (laughs) And I gravitated towards things like singing and music when I was little. And as I got into my teen years, really had a a un toque, a curiosity around languages and cultures and other spaces. And uh, traveling to Latin America, specifically Dominican Republic at 16, um, being immersed in Spanish, I was no better. I was like a B minus student in foreign language. I mean, please understand I was not gifted at that point in languages. And I really struggled to develop my second language. And at that time, I felt like that was something that I had earned really, like it was something of my own that nobody could take away from me in my language development. And the exposure and the openness to other ideas and even ways of understanding myself and seeing the world was so it was transformative. It continues to be a transformative experience. And I always had this sense. I th- I believe that education is a spiritual calling. I don't know if you feel the same way. It's something that you just, you're born into this world and you just gravitate towards it. And if you are lucky, you find your pathways to make, to be in spaces around education where you feel really fulfilled. And I would say that is something that I seek to do. And the teachers that I coach and mentor and train is help them find their way back to what their calling was as, as a teacher. Well, (laughs) you are, I I think, I really appreciate what you said that teaching is a spiritual calling. And I feel like we are lucky to call, to respond to this call. I do too. I think so too. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I don't know if that was a story. It's just more that that was the experience and exposure I had and then all of the love and support from family members and my my colleagues and then when I started doing it they were like oh yeah for sure you're a teacher <laughs> people can tell right some people are like who you should never be a teacher and some people are like yep that's you they're like enough Lily and we've heard enough about this okay that's fine yeah yeah <laughs> See, I would would not shut up about all the things I was learning and and about my students and um anyway yeah so yeah that's that's what le- that's what launched me into specifically bilingual education. So I was a I was in my early career. I was a New York City public school teacher in the Bronx in second grades and fourth grades. I tended to teach the Spanish uh, instruction in a side by side 50 50 two way dual language model. Um, and I have beautiful stories of of resilience and of and of breaking through and developing curriculum. And then I have cringe, achy, bummer stories yeah. where the topic that I'll be talking about today really had me question those and decisions of power and key stakeholders and their commitment to equity and bilingual education, which I would say was the, the path that led me towards pursuing the doctorate and, and um, building out this business and, and coming up with the construct of the monolingual bias specifically. Right. So let's actually dive right there. What is the model mm-hmm. of bias? Can you give us examples from either your life or your work as teachers? Yeah. So um, the thing about the monolingual bias is it's something that anybody that's working in education, specifically in ESL or bilingual spaces, you already know what it is. Okay. So I'm just giving a framing or a label to what this thing is. And anybody I've spoken to has said, oh, yeah, 
So the monolingual bias is this set of toxic ideas or ideologies, beliefs and attitudes about language that promotes a narrative that our emergent bilinguals must acquire academic English proficiency quickly and at all costs. At costs to their humanity, costs to the full development of their heritage language, costs to access to their culture and their community. And it's done in the service of this rapid acceleration towards assimilation to like a, like a mainstream monoculture, right? So it's ideologies that are anchored in a narrative of English is going to be the thing that gets kiddos to assimilate and to seem and present as American. And once you start to see the bias everywhere in policies and practices, even in these subtle, they don't understand English and it's my job to get them there. You see it in moments where kiddos are pulled from bilingual programs and thrown into remediation classes, um, a lot of hand wringing around their English not developing. And I laugh because it makes me uncomfortable. Anytime I see a practitioner reference the Thomas and Collier studies, the longitudinal studies that I'm certain that you know of, Tan. And so it's the first thing that you get in your endorsements around bilingual education. But but I thought that their heritage language actually helps them with their English acquisition. It's met with real resistance and the belief in this story that they just really need immersion. So how does that track for you in terms of a construct that you've seen and understand? <laughs> yeah, I've definitely seen that. In the international world, we see uh, the prevalence of English only signs or policies where heads of schools will say, because we're an international school, everyone will speak English. And I'm like, you there know, you that go. that's like really, the United Nations is not an English only place. And they have, they have six official languages and people have interpreters. Mm -hmm. And so heads mm -hmm. of states can come and speak whatever <laughs> language they have and their languages are welcomed and then interpreted. <laughs> Yet our schools are like English only signs in the, I understand why. The purpose is intention, the well intention is like, let's get them to have English so that they can be quote unquote marketable in the international world where their, par their parents want their kids to go abroad and to do business uh, with multiple countries. And of course they're gonna need English but not at the expense of other things. I'm so glad that you brought it back to that because as a bilingual researcher and have been in the field for over 20 years, I also want for our students to become proficient in English. I never want it to be at the cost of all of these other things. And also if we have all these languages in the world and our evolution, there's a reason and a purpose for multilingualism. And so we don't want to strip all of that away and it should never come at the cost. And I see that it's doing a real harm and a real injustice to the communities that we're seeking to serve and support. The way I tell parents and uh, family members or whoever, whoever pushes back, I usually say, when an artist paint, they usually have multiple, multiple palettes of colors instead of just one color, a black, or white, or hues of black, or hues of yeah. white. They like we yeah. don't want a colorless rainbow, and so you can use different Beautiful. colors to do different things. And all those colors are equally valuable. You know, I love that you went to a metaphor. I'm a metaphor girly myself, and I find that metaphors help us see things in a slightly different perspective. To continue with the art metaphor, um, I actually like the metaphor of why would you ever tell a kiddo in a math class to only use one strategy or tool to solve something like you can never do drawings, but you can only use right. numbers and algorithms. Right. So, yes, we want the full landscape tapestry of resources, linguistic and otherwise. Look at me. I'm gesturing. I'm a, I'm a Jew. So I love to gesture and speak with my hands and speak with my body. And that's another means of communication. And why would we ever you know, strip something like that away from right. a human. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you were mentioning uh, Collier and uh, Thomas's work. Would you talk about that yeah. for those who are not familiar with that? Oh, sure. Yes. Gosh, I always assume, but should not. So what is really exciting about their research, which I think at this point spans 15, if not 20 years, yeah is that they were able to capture longitudinally, so over a series of time points, bilingual versus, bi bilingual students in dual or bilingual 
instructional spaces and their testing score outputs against born bilingual, but into English immersion and stripping away the home language, their test scores across those same time points to see what the influence of the home language being built out had on their second language growth. And that is really the gold standard in terms of, will we have the evidence that building up, which makes a lot of sense to all of us in this space, that if you can think and build out abstract understandings in your home language, then you'll have the ability to do that across other languages that you seek because the wiring has has gotten there. Um, they they have found that there is a ceiling effect, which in in statistics, as I understand a ceiling effect, is that there is a real limit to what cognitively the brain can achieve in the second language if it has not been built up in that first or that home language. So we don't want to be handicapping, not well, I guess that's an ableist term, but we don't want to be limiting um, bilinguals by not giving them the full opportunities to build out their first language. So that's just on a purely, if test scores are the thing that you're seeking, which of course in educational spaces, that is what is assessed and examined. Um, I'd argue that the SEL component, the social emotional component is just as valuable and worth holding as a, as a counterpoint to that, that they won't have the full expression of their selves or access to their grandparents' language practices um, to feel that they see themselves as a real member of a community that they're a part of. That's right. So, and then of course that social emotionally, um, it it is doing a real damage to our students' humanity, to their sense of selves. Again, the monolingual bias comes at costs to their senses of identity and who they are. And I believe one of the biggest obstacles that we face in world language and bilingual education is that our, student, our students aren't able to see themselves in instruction and in curriculum. Right. And the monolingual bias assures that we won't build out programs that have them see themselves. So right. the thing about the monolingual bias, I talk about it as the apex villain, the apex villain in matters of bilingual education. And the thing about villains, Tan, is that they are singularly focused and they are abundantly motivated to bring down the protagonist. That is what a successful, skillful villain does. Disney has taught us this, right? And so they will stop, they will, they will work and they will, they will go at all costs to make sure that the that the protagonist is foiled. So when I talk about disrupting the monolingual bias, it means that we need to be ever vi vigilant and aware of where the villain presents itself so that we can spot it and we can act quickly and with our squad of equity-minded allies to take it down. Right. Do, before we go back to uh, talking mm -hmm. about villains and stuff, um, I wanted to summarize Collier's and uh, Thomas's work. He, they basically said they went to North Carolina and they found uh, longitudinal work for all of the students in North Carolina who took the state standardized assessment. And they found at the end that the kids who, the multilingual students who received pullout extraction experienced the worst, lowest achievement. Mm -hmm. it, it not just only plateaued, but it actually decreased. Uh, and, but then when we look at students who were in both in uh, dual language programs, would they continue to have dual language? continued not just, oh, okay, you, you have enough Spanish now in English. Let's let's take you out of English and let's keep you, let's take you out of Spanish. Let's keep you in English. They actually tracked the one that students who've gone through all the way from K to 12 to ha who have both bilingual education, English and Spanish, they outperformed other students. But their achievement mm. was from other ELs who uh, achieved only 24 percentile. The students who had mm -hmm. bilingual education has 62. And that's a huge, huge achievement. They found it from, didn't matter where you're born, didn't matter if you're rich or poor, didn't matter if you went to a charter school or a, or just a, a typical public school, didn't matter if you're from the city or, or rural settings. If you had dual language education and the longer you had dual language education, the more achievement you experience on safe standardized assessments. Well, you knew more figures than I did on that one. I also wanted to point out that within their um, their sample, they had black students, yes. which is to say that this does not only serve 
you think, oh, it's good then for the kid, the kiddos that had a home language other than English by by dialectal, right? Kiddos that hold different dialects of a language also flourish. And it seems like this has something to do with their cognition and wiring around it and the, the flexibility and nimbleness that multilinguals have insofar as accessing their entire language repertoires. Exactly. Let's talk about from the language repertoire to a theory of change for the field of bilingual and TESO education. What does that look like? Ooh, thanks for asking. Yeah, so um, when I built my business at the end of getting through this doctoral program and the thing about doctoral programs is that you you, you read a lot of research and you, if if you're in a if you're in a good one like I was, shout out to New York University Steinhardt School of Education and all of my mentors there. You have an opportunity to really think through big constructs and what they have to do for the daily work in schools. And as I was doing that, I thought, okay, what is my vision for what is holding this field back, and what changes do we need to see? So I see those across three different ways. The first is that any in any work and conversations around bilingual education, they have to do with equity, equity. And there is no pursuing forward or making any advances if they are not steeped in the acknowledgement and recognition of all of the court cases and legal things that have been fought and won on the basis of language rights. So equity is the first lane. The second is that teachers of emergent bilinguals deserve to have a healthy literacy praxis, P-R-A-X-I-S, praxis. And of course, praxis is that we take from theories, we use the theories to inform our instruction, and then on the basis of what we observe in our teaching, we get to return back to the theories and decide if they hold truth, if they seem valid, if there are other theories that seem to inspire or befit the data and the work that we're seeing in the classroom. So it's this feedback loop. I promote sociocultural theories of language teaching and learning. So you're good Vygotsky that learners learn through interaction and through talk and through play, right? So sociocultural theories of teaching and learning as it's brought to bear in language. So literacy praxis is number two. The third, is that teachers' voices and their multiple identities deserve to be valued and seen in the spaces in which they work. And through their voices, right, and their identities, that's my pathway for teacher empowerment. So you don't get true power from within mm -hmm. when you who you are is stifled and you don't get to be the full expression of who you are, right? Right. So even if, so it, in that, this perhaps seems lofty or, okay, nice try, Lil, in the space that I'm working in, there is no way that I'm able to be the full version of myself. Well, then I would say, let's talk about what sort of structures there are around you in that space. Right. What ways can you disrupt and be who you are? And if it truly is an oppressive system for you, then you're not able to respond to that calling of spirituality that brought you into the profession. We need to find a different instructional and school space for you. So let's share some strategies. Let's say you're talking to a room of admin and, and uh, district superintendents. Well, what, what are some moving away from theory to practices? Yeah. What would you yeah. recommend for their practice? Yeah. So I would say also for administrators, what sort of praxis, what are the, which, you know, here I am going right back to theory. If you see that there is an award-winning curriculum, right? Okay, you can take that. But you, I want for building leaders and supervisors to also stay very closely, stay close to their experiences instructionally to say, how would you navigate this set of lesson plans? It's about oracy and it's about meta language. And those are the two constructs in language teaching that I will always promote. So oracy, of course, is the formal development, the, the development of oral language and formal academic spaces that students should be speaking in the class more than the teacher is. The teacher and more of a facilitator support role and the kiddos are the ones doing the speaking and a lot of the listening. Right. 
<laughs> and then in terms of meta language, so language that talks about, analyzes, and describes language. So grammar words are live in the space of a meta language. Um, any words that you would use to analyze a text or to talk about what makes a text work or interesting or breaking down a text. I can point to Dr. Lily Wong Fillmore's work around juicy sentences, which talk about something that influenced me back as a younger teacher. I was engaged in that work in 2009, and she really promoted this notion of meta language. We want our teachers to be skillful text analysis gurus, ninjas, that they're in there, they're nimble, they're taking from things, and they're modeling those practices for their students. One of the services I offer is close reading with juicy sentences. So I have my own version of doing that type of work with teachers and ELA settings, not only, but also science teachers or math teachers. How do you deconstruct or break down a word problem with this register of metalinguistic terms? Because Math language is its own set of language and logics and tools that math teachers probably deeply understand and know. They just need to make it visible for the kiddos. So to bring it back, building a meta language mindset, right? So you're always thinking in terms of language and oracy is one of those cornerstone pieces of that. Right. So how do we build that metalinguistic mindset? And then how do we build oracy? Yeah, well, <laughs> Uh, so meta language, there's a lot to learn about it. Um, it is moving. So a, a, a non-example of meta language is getting a student's piece of writing back and saying, that's not how you say it, or that's awkward. It's not giving any actual description or further tools around building out the language understandings for the kiddo to go forth. It's demonstrating models and then sprinkling over. So this is what a clause looks like. So you're going to have to actually learn some grammar words and then get a lot of feedback from mentors on the use of it. Hey, guess what? We've got the internet. The internet has a lot of that information that you can go seek out and access. It's really putting a gloss or a layering over of these of these things. It's it's starting to see yourself as an applied linguist in, a, in the classroom. Um, and I, I think an important thing for how do you build it it's pushing through an imposter syndrome that I can't understand language and grammatical things about language. I really, it warrants saying that because hello, I had my <laughs> years feeling like an imposter with language and grammatical terms. I really did. And at some point I had to say, Lil, you're here, you're bilingual. You can understand these things, but you have to believe in yourself. So that's that empowerment piece that I come back to. And you have to want to understand it and believe that there's value in your students doing it too. Right. Because here's the thing that any multilingual knows, and I know that you know this. Multilinguals are already naturally gifted with metalanguage understandings. Right. It's the way that our brains have been able to receive and make sense of the different languages. So now we're just peppering on some terms so that it can really deeply on a level of analysis and description understand. So the oracy piece comes in because kiddos get really excited deconstructing and talking about texts and why this one is interesting. And hello, they become stronger writers. They become stronger thinkers. They can now go out into the world and create and create texts and be the fullest expressions of themselves because they have all of this understanding is around language. So to be a skillful politician, to be a skillful mathematician, to be skillful in any field, you need to really deeply understand how those languages work. Let's jump into juicy sentences that you mentioned by the uh, the grand dam, uh, uh, Lily Fillmore, uh, Wong Fillmore. Yeah. Um, would you talk about juicy sentences, the concept of them, the implementation yeah. of them, but and then implementation of them in science and content classes? Right. So Dr. Lily Wong Fillmore. So Lily Wong Fillmore and Charles Fillmore are two linguists from Berkeley, California, and they did incredible breathtaking work in the field of educational linguistics. Um, Lily Wong Fillmore describes a juicy sentence as a sentence that has a lot of layers, that has a lot of academic terms. It's the sort of sentence that you believe your emergent bilinguals might just skip over because there's too many heavy vocabulary words in them. But no, no, no. That's where we want to pause 
and realize that there is a lot of information held in this one from the first word to the final punctuation and go through and have a deeply metalinguistic exploration where you look at where the comma exists. You look at where the meaning of the words are. So if it's a word, so, so take, for example, the word digest. Digest is a verb, right? And in English and in other languages, you have this construction that evolves from digest to digestion. So the verb dresses up now as a noun, that's called a nominalization. And so if it's saying the digestive, which is now, hello, look at that, it's an adjective, the digestive system. So, and also there's been a ton of research in the last five to 10 years around morphology and around understanding root words and then seeing how they show up in these other ways within a sentence so that the core meaning of this process, right? If it's digest, if it's to digest the process by which the body breaks down nutrients in the body. When you dress it up as a noun, now you can say something about digestion for the predicate for the rest of the sentence. So even just now I've used nominalization, predicate, verb. I, if I'm doing juicy sentence work, I need a meta language register to be able to describe and talk about it. Not because I'm diagramming a sentence that's just gonna go in some some like outbox and, and die because that means something for my brain understanding and building tools to then me go right as a scientist and talk about the digestive system. And hey, by the way, if I choose to add another language to my experience in life, I have a foundational grammar, a logic structure and understanding. If I wanna go code, which I know many youngsters are doing, excuse me, that syntax and grammar and structure, and that will also serve that community very well. And in fact, coders are bilingual, as you know, because they navigate computer languages in addition to their home language. Right. So in other words, uh, juicy sentences are really dense. Uh, I call them fat sentences. So we'll have, or pack sentences, and we have to unpack them. Yes. And we stop at commas to figure out, oh, every time there's a comma, there is a, a detail that's added. So let's uh, let's continue with the conversation of juicy sentences about uh, you. You gave a digestive, you gave a digestion, digestive example. But now, how do we teach that? Like, how do we? What's the rest? What does that look like in science class? So hard for me to do without visual tools <laughs> to illustrate and explain it. Um, which just goes to show you that language is multimodal, and the more yes. tools and resources we have access to. So typically, what I'll do is I will. I will either ask the teachers I'm working with to pluck what they believe to be a juicy sentence from a text that they're looking at. It can also be from a video, but typically it's from academic texts. Right. And we throw that one up on the board and we start to notice where are the pause points that the you just mentioned. Yeah. Also, where are the areas where your kiddos are going to get tripped up? So maybe that's on a very technical tier three term. So we might start to do some morphology breaking down. So it's chunking. It's not only chunking of the sentence, but it's also chunking of the parts of the words themselves. And it is really sort of within one word, bu building out, maybe adding an annotation. It's a lot of annotations of maybe that's what this thing means. Or what I love to do also, which blows teachers' minds, is to look at the conjunctions. So you might have a sentence the digestive system helps the body break down, but when there are fats and acid, I don't know, I'm totally out of my lane in terms of like the digestive system, but when there are unhealthy foods that creates blockages in the arteries, let's say. So sitting on that but, which we know kids understand and saying an author is using that to signal a contrast, that whatever information is coming in the second part of the sentence is somehow opposite changing right. the opposite right. right or maybe it's just it's a it's a tenor it's a vibe that the beginning part of it was something positive or assertive right. and what comes after it is refuting or something more negative right. so doing detective work right. with looking for the conjunctions versus if it was an and which is a neutral conjunction right. which is an extending right. of it right. yeah so that's i like doing conjunctions uh, and particularly when I we, when I teach the conjunction of comma but, my students I tell my students oh it's like comma but it's like canceling, but you got canceled, 
And so this, because mm. I'm using the language that they speak to each other. Like, don't try to cancel me. Right? And so mm-hmm. I'm like, well, oh, well, comma, but is just exactly what professional language is. We're just canceling each other using comma, but the kids are like, oh, mm-hmm. I get it. And so that's. The- yeah. And of course, to cancel means that there had to be something active happening prior to it. So there you could also, if you wanted to talk about time points, right? Because anyway, it's, there's a lot, the thing about language is that it, it is a, it is a systematic, it's structured and systematic to represent our worlds and our lived experiences. And we live through time. (laughs) Let's talk about, um, multilingualism. So let's stay with juicy sentences. And if we don't want to just have like English at all costs, how do we bring multilingualism as students are uh, engaging with juicy sentences? Mm -hmm. So earlier in this conversation, we spoke about how you would never want as a painter to limit to just one color or shades of a color. So because language is our best meaning making apparatus, in terms of comprehension and understanding, then we would like to have access to all the tools of meaning making and comprehension that we can. So access to the home language will help us in navigating these very dense, tricky, abstract understandings. And oh, bonus, if there's cognates around, and if that word has been mentioned in the home language and you can pair, associate those two, and importantly, if a word looks very differently than the other word, it is also helpful for the brain to see those differences and to notice that there is a relationship at the level of meaning, but maybe not at the level of orthography and spelling. So the more that we can engage in contrastive analysis, which also goes back to this notion of meta language, is holding the two, which is something that give kiddos that are bilingual, one of their gifts is acknowledging the similarities and differences across languages and knowing how to encode those and to proceed forward. And so if you never build out or if it if you act like the other language is not helpful or even welcomed in this space, then you're losing out on cognitive development opportunities for those children. And also that is supporting bringing other languages in the intellectual development of all of the kiddos in the room, right? Kim Patowski is a scholar in, in in Chicago where I live. And she talks about leave no monolingual child behind. Okay. And she points to all of the deficits of monolingualism. And I love it because it's certainly true. I just, I shared a story at the top of this call about my life transforming when I had access to more languages. So why would we not want that for our students? And in fact, in this era, at least in U.S. contexts, there is real excitement around bringing monolingual kiddos into bilingual spaces. But we never want it to be at the cost of our bilinguals getting spaces in those programs, too. That's a separate conversation. So let's give a personal example. You have a daughter and she's four and Mm -hmm. she's uh, becoming bilingual. She knows yeah. English and she right, currently is in Mexico. She, she has more exposure to Espanol. So how, yeah. as a person who has a PhD, highly educated, <laughs> how are mm. you creating a, a bilingual space for her to grow into that, to move away from monolingualism to bilingualism? Yeah, so you might be surprised at my answer because most, most people that have asked me this question are surprised with what I say. I'm not pressuring her to speak in Spanish. I am attuned to her emotional responses back to this SEL. For me, it comes, it starts there. So I'm observant of where her curiosities lead her in the language and to be clear. And also the stakes are quite low, she's four. If she were seven or eight, I might have a different answer. So I'll just acknowledge that. But even when she's babbling and she looks at me, like I'm supposed to understand that she's speaking in Spanish, she's playing or performing being bilingual. So just acknowledge that play is a big part of being multilingual and accessing into this space. And so then I'll nod my head and I'll respond in Spanish to her and she'll shake her head like, yeah, we're talking in Spanish, mommy. I was like, okay. (laughs) Um, I also have enrolled her in a full Spanish daycare for a couple hours of the week. And you know what? She cries when she goes there and she has a very normal emotional response to being in a space where she is not understood. And I want to see her emotional responses to that. 
I don't want her to just comply with me and act like nothing is wrong because actually her body is telling me that this is uncomfortable yeah. for her. So I, and I, I sit and I hold space for her and I acknowledge it. And I say, that's what we do when we're here. We learn our Spanish and I am your mother. And it is always my responsibility to help and support you with all of the things in your life. And that includes your languages and God bless this daycare. They do songs. It's Montessori inspired. They have their little works. She's able to spend time being quiet and listening. And I asked her yesterday, do you ever sing with the songs? And she says, no, mommy, I do it with my body. I was like, brilliant. You use your gestures and you fake it till you make it, which is, as you know, learning another language. It's such a big part of language development is trying things out. The words are going to feel like marbles in our mouths for so long until we finally own them and something clicks in our brain. And there's just this stamina that you really need with hanging out in a new language. Mm -hmm. And then I am certain, Tam, that when we go back to Chicago, she is going to feel so proud and confident of her bilingualism, ha however much it has grown. But the thing that you know is that we need to give a lot of patience and time points for the languages to grow back to the Thomas and Collier longitudinal study. It's not going to happen immediately. But then again, what things in life happen right away, right? Most of us aren't winning the lottery and it changes our life instantly. Things just really do need to take time and a lot of patience and perseverance. All right. Can you give two examples of schools you've seen that have done this, have moved, uh, created uh, a space for multilingualism instead of monolingual bias? Yeah, well, I'll speak to an entire network. And um, the Internationals Network that was started in New York City about 15 or so years ago, and it's for high schools. And they completely disrupted the monolingual bias model by saying, we are going to receive all of the newcomers and we are going to intentionally design instruction that centers a multilingual ecology. They were, I believe the Internationals Network was one of the first spaces that used the emergent bilingual term, like before everybody else started to do so. They codified translanguaging pedagogies into their curriculum and all of the teachers got really high level training from the queen, Dr. Ophelia Garcia yes, herself. Yes, yes. yes. Um, where this flexibility of the metalinguistic understandings, that was what was valued in that space. And you, I believe that their graduation rates were higher, kiddos felt senses of belonging, they navigated cultural differences with grace and vulnerability and humility. And I believe that the Internationals Network has expanded outside of New York City, if I'm not mistaken. I believe that they were granted magnet or charter status. They did, they had, of course, they had to navigate policies of being in the public education system in order to, they also, they had portfolio assessments. They had performance-based assessments. They still did their standardized assessments. They had to because they were public schools, but they didn't use those as the only measurements of the student's successes. So they did a lot of disruptive work at every level of the school in order to combat that monolingual bias, to say that we're going to remove it at all costs to your heritage, your language, and your identity. Right. And now those kiddos, I'm sure, are crushing it. Kiddos, they're young adults in the colleges that they're in because they probably have three languages at this point, if not more, and they're able to use that ling linguistic flexibility. And they're not going to be remediated in English because they were able to build out and do interesting things with their English language development. Yeah. yeah. You said they um there were they did some disruptions. So let's talk about let's end the podcast. We're talking about five doable disruptions or five doable actions that teacher schools can do to create bilingual spaces. Yeah. Bilingual spaces. Mm -hmm. So five. Let's see. The first one is to resist the need to feel like you need to translate for newcomers. Translating or going into the other language has its place in instruction and design. It needs to be intentional and not this default thing. Because if you're always translating for kiddos, especially in an English medium space, when are they ever getting the rich oracy to actually hear English? 
and proceed there. So that's one of the first ones. The second disruption is to have the teacher be speaking less and to have the students be speaking more, right? So a lot of that comprehensible input stuff, a lot of the wait time would be disruptions because you wanna give the kiddos these, link these you wanna press on their output, have some of these opportunities, sit in the uncomfortable silence, and have them try to figure out and find what the language was or do turn and talks if that's a practice that you do so that the kiddos can be speaking more and the teacher isn't taking up so much airtime. That's the second one. The third one is that meta language mindset that I already described earlier today, where you're thinking in terms of language, you're planning for language moments, you're bringing in juicy sentences intentionally into your curriculum, through the read alouds that you're doing, I would say that that's a third more instructional programmatic level disruption. The fourth, if I had to play favorites, the fourth is to find your squad of equity minded allies and to be vigilant of the monolingual bias and to always be strategizing on how you are going to preserve and build out the equity spaces in your schools, right? So it's keeping the people that you know believe in you and that you can hold them accountable and they hold you accountable for sticking within your values. When I think back to my experiences as a teacher, it was the allies that I kept that believed in me. It was the administrators, my mentors, my role models that saw that I was hungry for learning more and for doing right by my students and their yes. families. So that would be the fourth doable disruption. And then I suppose the fifth one would be to take care of yourself take care of your spirit, to nurture that part of you that makes you you, if that's exercise, if that's reading, if it is going to Comic-Con, I mean, any of the things, if it is spending 30 minutes on TikTok at the end of the night because you want to watch whatever cat videos that delight you, like bring joy and delight into your life and turn the laptop, you know, give yourself the boundary, which I think the younger generation is better about doing. You have to meet your responsibilities, but find boundary ways to keep yourself sane and balanced. Teachers can have a balanced life and lifestyle. You deserve it. It's how you're going to preserve your spirit and be the best version of yourself for your students and for your community. Well, Dr. Lillian Ardell, muchas gracias for bringing joy and delight to us on the podcast <laughs> and for following your call to become a teacher. And uh, you are shedding the light for us on how we can move from monolingualism to multilingualism, multiculturalism. Can I say one more thing about my keynote? So um, I do have this keynote disrupting the monolingual bias. I have been working so many hours on this being surprise and delight keynote. And I have two more spots left this summer where I'm giving it for free to any districts that want to book me for their summer institute or their, their summit that they're having. I'm looking for big school districts where you have an energy around empowerment and disruption. And if you would like to book, again, it's completely free of charge to the district. I wanna get onto that stage and I want to inspire you to see this monolingual bias and ways how to disrupt it. So you can reach out to me through my Instagram, which is at language matters. You can go to my website, www.languagematters.org. Find me on LinkedIn, Lillian Ardell. Just get to me quick because these two spots are going to fill up really quickly. And I know that you've got a lot of followers that are interested in equity and social justice and come get me before my price is raised. <laughs> <laughs> From free to something, anything else is going to be expensive. So, <laughs> Well, I mean, free is free. So free, yeah. Free. And you're, you're also, worth it. it's, it's a good keynote. It's so yeah, keynote. I just wanted to promote that last. Yes. Well, thank you, Dr. Ardell. Sure. Thanks for having me on 10. <laughs>